All right, well, good after well, afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Sean Conley. I'm the state soybean and small grain specialist at University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, there are a few familiar faces out here. Some of you aren't so familiar. So for those of you that don't know me or haven't dealt with me before, I just want to remind everyone I run a very open, informal program. Feel free to ask me any questions you may have throughout this entire presentation. Um, my MO is to typically slam five hours of information into 45 minutes or less. So that's what I'll probably do today. But if I don't get through all my slides, that's quite all right. Um, I'd much rather have this be an open forum and discussion than a straight lecture. So feel free to ask me any questions as we go through. Well, a couple of things I want to point out today. First of all, is this, um, what I'm going to be talking today is a, a, accumulation of three years of research, over 60 site years across the country. And this research was sponsored by the United Soybean Board uh, in terms of the, the checkoff dollars. But I also want to give my own checkoff board of Wisconsin Soybean Association a lot of credit. About 80% of the research that I do within the state of Wisconsin is funded through checkoff dollars and, and grower support. So I want to thank them. I also want to thank the United Soybean Board as we go through today. All right, so for those of you, again, that are not familiar with my program, I kind of want to always give people a quick and dirty overview of what I do. So a couple things we want, I always like to talk about is my, my project is two-pronged, two if you will. One of, my, uh, techni one of my technicians, Adam Roth, he runs a variety testing program. I guess very similar to what Emerson Nafta Sager does across the state of uh, Illinois. And these are the locations that we run across the state. Uh, one of the powers that this gives me, it gives me a lot of different environments, a lot of different opportunities to look at some maturity group differences, seed treatment differences across the state, but it also gives me a lot of yield environments. And a good example is over the last few years, like here's my Platteville site. I like to pot point this one out. So we had, almost, we had 90, roughly 90 varieties in that trial this year. Our lowest yielding variety ran 73 bushels per acre. Our highest ran 93 bushels per acre. And trial average was 85. We had, I think, five plots over 100 bushels this year. Last year, we had 11 over 100 bushels per year. So it gives you an idea of the yield environments that we're testing, not just the genetics, but a lot of our management practices under as well. Arlington was very similar, 61 to 91, trial average of 77. And we had a few plots over 100 there as well. So again, just to give everyone a, a, a range of what we're seeing here across the state. East Troy, I would have been over 100, but we had just a whiff of white mold come in and take the top end off of some of the varieties. But otherwise, we're usually running right in there. And that's usually my SDS, SCN site. So if I get done with this, I have a little bit of time. I'd like to also share some of the work we've done with iLevo, some of the work that we've done with that product across the state and its efficacy on, on on SDS. So as we get in, so how this project initially started was basically back in 2009. My, my colleague of mine, Pella Pedersen, before he bolted and went to industry, seems like all my colleagues eventually bolt and go to industry. Uh, Vince Davis did the same thing, so he's now with BASF. People ask me, when am I going to industry? I said, the price point hasn't occurred yet. <laughs> 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 but when, when that point happens, um, I basically, because I always get harassed in my office, you don't have anything hanging on the walls. Like, well, that's going to be an easy exit strategy. But eh, that's kind of a joke. All right. So he basically started his first program. It's called the Kitchen Sink Project, funded by the United Soybean Board. It was really focusing in on some of these main input products at that time and looking at what really drives yield. There's a couple cool things I want to point about this. And you could tell my grad student had access to this slide. I want to thank him for adding that on here. Some of the quick highlights I want to talk about that before I get into the new project are some of these quick questions. The number one project that came out that we already know this answer to is narrow rows in general have higher yields. So by narrow rows, I say anything 20 inches or less. So when I'm talking to growers across the state of Wisconsin, frankly, I don't care if they plant 7.5s, 8s, 12s, 15s, 20s, even if you get the sugar beet country 22, relatively speaking, they all yield the same. We tend to see in, on average, maybe not this year because we had such a tremendous growing season, we tend to see 30 inch row beans on average yield 5 to 8% less. All right? That's on the on average. However, one of the cool things we noticed with this research is that 
I always have growers give me a lot of pushback on this whole idea about row spacing and response. And they're like, well, I've, I've switched over equipment costs. I couldn't afford the row units. I want a bigger planter. I really want to go to 30s. I just want one planter run my entire operation. And, and those 30s yield exactly the same as my 15s and did, or 20, 15s did, 7.5s did 10 years ago. And I'll say you are absolutely correct. And here's the reason why. With today's inputs, seed treatments, earlier plantings, foliar fungicides, foliar insecticides, we have essentially removed that 5 to 8 percent yield penalty on row spacing. Okay, so if we have 30 inch rows with inputs, we are at the same yield level as 15s without inputs. But what are we missing? 15s with what? Inputs. Okay, so when you talk to growers, that's true. I will I will agree to the penny, but that's the response we're doing. Now I understand why growers have moved to that. One-on-one -on -one is center fill efficiency for planting, because in Wisconsin we see anywhere from a 0.2 bushel per acre per day yield penalty in Spooner, which is the tree line for you guys. Uh, actually, I think most of our soybeans up in Spooner are used for deer plots. Uh, and whatever survives, they harvest and take for grain. All the way down to southern Wisconsin, where we have guys driving across the border and getting early threes because their seed rep in Wisconsin won't sell them a three. So we see that kind of movement across the board. And what we tend to see is that in southern Wisconsin, we see a half a bushel per acre per day yield penalty after May 1. So it kind of makes sense. If you're able to plant 30 inch row beans twice as fast, three times as fast, the yield penalty may disappear a little bit because you can get the beans in three times as fast. So instead of losing half a bushel per acre per day delayed, pep, delayed yield on the 15s, because you can only have half the size of equipment, you maybe get in the planting date. Does that make sense? So that's generally what we see. Okay, so I don't really get too, too crazy about this idea. You know, in 20 years from now, I, I, my proclamation is everybody, everybody will be on 20 inch row spacings. That's my proclamation. 20 years from now, corn and beans, everything will be on 20s. It'll all be the same. And our corn and our soybean populations will both be the same too. Somewhere about 70, 80,000. The reason I say that is because if I'm right, I will remember. If I'm wrong, you won't remember I said this. <laughs> so I have that going in. Uh, one person did tape me and said, I'm gonna I'll harass you about that in, t in 20 years. And I said, well, I might not be here in 20 years. All right, so that's kind of the basis of where we came today. So then what we, what we did is we come through and had this larger study, basically the updated, updated kitchen sink experiment. What we're really interested in is this whole idea of input system interactions. What I mean by that is we hear a lot of things on the corn side about input interactions. If you have product A, input B, have them together, they're here. We have these synergies. The question is, do you see those synergies on the soybean side or what's going on with these input interactions? The second one comes back to this cultivar by input interactions. You know, I just saw this come across Twitter. I think companies, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but they, they basically spend 10 times the amount of research funding on corn as they do on, on the soybean side. Not just management, but genetics as well. And one of the interesting things we see is, again, some of these input by hybrid interactions on the corn side, we're like, well, how much is that just happens on the soybean side? And mainly because Five years ago, eight years ago, if you had a good bean, that good bean would be here five years, six years. If you have a good bean today, how long is it in the company profile? Two, maybe three if it's a rock star. And by the time you get that cultivar figured out of what inputs it interacts with, where's that, high, or that, where's that cultivar? Out the door. So we're really trying to see how big of an interaction do we have. And the last one comes down to population by input systems. And what's really driving this is the fact that A, economics are driving growers to lower, to lower seeding rates. But then you see the yield contest guys saying, oh, well, you need to be pushing these high populations and dumping the inputs. So do we see an interaction there between populations? So that's kind of the framework of these different experiments. So this experiment. Uh, we basically went from 2012 to 2014. These are the states involved, so we did have Illinois involved, Iowa, Wisconsin. So about 20 locations total in each year. So here's kind of a map of where these trial locations were. So over here, closest to us would be the Janesville, right across the border, or East Troy, uh, where these. 
Emerson had it in Monmouth uh, and Urbana, so we're, again, we have a good, a good range across the state. And actually, it's pretty funny. When Pella left Iowa State, they didn't have a soybean agronomist at that point. So I would usually just across, you know, well, I'm so far away from Iowa State, they didn't know what I was doing anyhow, but I'd sneak across the border and I'd put plots in Iowa, and then I'd always tweet out to all my Iowa State fans, like, hey, I'm in your state doing your job for you. <laughs> <laughs> they really loved it when I was in there. So that was a lot of fun for me, though. All right, so this gives you a framework. These are all the yahoos that were in it. These are the guys that did the work. All right, so this is David Marburger. Um, he was my graduate student that uh, just got a job. He'll be going to Oklahoma State University in a month, and he'll be the wheat specialist at Oklahoma State. So I'm pretty excited about, about that. John Orlowski, he's actually the soybean uh, specialist down at Mississippi State. Uh, he's originally from New the state of New York, so he's having a little bit of cultural change down there. But uh, he's getting used to it. He likes the food, he said. And then some of the other students, Minnesota, Michigan State, and, and Kansas. All right, so let's get into the objectives of the study. Again, we really want to look at how these inputs and combinations of inputs really drive these high input management systems. So there's 16 total treatments. So we had our base uh, treatment here, our base with our control. So this would be university, either Illinois or Wisconsin-based soil test recommendations for P and K, planning date recommendations, Weed management, a pre followed by you know, at least one post, you know, mixing modes of action. So again, this is what we have in our best management practices regarding uh, soybeans. Then we started adding these different combinations. We either had seed applied, foliar applied, or combinations of seed. And then we'll kind of walk through these in a minute. So just to give you a sense, we couldn't test all of these. So in this sense of this experiment, we were testing, uh, we tried to pick across company profiles in terms of getting inputs. Uh, the seed treatment we looked at was in, it would have been at this time the base accelerant, you know, in that stretch from 2012 to 2014, those AIs are probably slightly different than they are today with how they, they switched those up. The next one would, in addition to this fungicide seed treatment, we would have added the matacloprid and the poncho votivo on top of that. The next one, we would have added an inoculant. In this case, we would have picked Optimize, but we just chose that one. It could have been another inoculant, followed by another LCO. That would have been Ratchet. And I don't know, even know if that's labeled anymore. I don't think they even sell this anymore in soybeans as a foliar. But at this time, they were really pushing it. We were looking at some of the, the foliar applications. Some of the foliars, we were looking at putting urea out, treated with both agrotane and ESN. So 75 pounds of acre of urea of agrotane and ESN. We put that out at V4. Our goal there was to not mess up biological end fixation and, and slow release nitrogen, nitrogen throughout the growing season. So this one here, Cobra, we did, I want to be clear, we did not treat this as a weed control product. This goal here was to almost kill that bean and kind of get back to this question that we've been hearing across the industry, a lot of, uh, of people are saying, well, you know, in order to really get beans to yield well, you need to kill them almost and then bring them back. So that was our goal here. So this is 12 fluid ounces of Cobra with 1% 1 um, 1 nitrogen and 1% crop oil. So basically I wanted that thing a stick. That was our goal with this one, is a stick out there. We came back with Bioforge um, at R3. I'm sorry, I missed this one. This would have been three gallons of, uh, actually this was only a gallon of task force, which would just be a foliar feed. Then we came back at R3, uh, in addition with headline, in year one, in years, so this would have been 2012, we used headline, in 13 and 14, we would have used Preaxor. Uh, for a foliar insecticide, we would have used Warrior II in, in 2012. In 13 and 14, we would have went to Endigo. So okay, we kind of switched these out just based on some of the input and feedback we had from some of the grower leaders across the country. Now let's look at our combinations. So we had a, our soya complete was basically all those inputs I told you about, minus the, that defoliant, because we thought that might have an interaction, and it did, and we'll kind of show that. Then we have the soya, which is everything, plus the defoliant. And then based on some of the, the initial data, we wanted to pull out from the soy mix would have been all those inputs. We pulled out nitrogen out of that whole mix. We pushed, pulled out foliar fungicide out of that whole mix and foliar fungicide and insecticide out of that whole mix, mainly because an in initial one, foliar fungicide was driving the ship. We're like, well, if we just pull that one out, 
What does that do to all of Russell's inputs and those interactions? All right, <clears throat> so let's get into the data here um, and kind of talk about this a little bit. So there were 60 site years analyzed. 26 site years showed significant treatment effects, and I'll go into that. I mean, what do we know about 2012? What was 2012? That was a drought year, very dry. So that was only six locations pop positive in 2012, 10 in 2013, and 20 in 14. So that's kind of like the national frame of reference. Let's get in the regional analysis. What we tended to see is the north, Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, we tend to see much more responsive sites. So where we are in, in Illinois right here, as we go through some of these inputs, you can kind of make your decision if you fall more in line with the I states in terms of that central Illinois corridor, or if we're you know, close enough to the Wisconsin border, you may fall more into the Wisconsin, Minnesota, Wisconsin interact or, um, responses. So take a look at these as we go through. But again, interestingly enough, it was the northern climates that tend to give us biggest responses, which was somewhat surprising. We would have thought the southern climates, given the disease pressures, would be higher responsiveness. I just tell my colleagues, we're just better agronomists in the north than they are in the south. All right, how I'm gonna lay this out, is this is gonna give basically a framework of, of what's going on. So you'll see yield here on the x-axis, or y-axis, excuse me, and then the treatment's right here. This right here, dotted line, this is, the un or this is our control, base management strategy in a given state, and how do we respond to that? And if you see a star above it, it shows us if we're statistically different or not. So again, we didn't have enough, we didn't have enough separation here in the south to have much of a difference, per se, but you can kind of see the yield level, the I states, the only thing that popped significant would have been the soya treatment. And then across the north, we see a lot more responses. Okay, we see a lot more responses here. So one of the things would have been the full C treatment, including inoculant, gave us a significantly diff higher yield. So in terms of the, it would be the fungicide, the, insectic the insecticide and an inoculant gave us the highest, gave us significantly higher yield in terms of the, the C treatment response. We did get a significant response to nitrogen. We'll talk about probability return on investment a little bit. We'll talk about the math of whether that paid or not. But in terms of nitrogen, we had a foliar fungicide, insecticide, and all of these. So again, we saw a lot of responses across the north. So let's kind of dig into this and see what's really driving the ship. And I don't really care about the national scale. That just gives a, a bigger picture. So here is where industry is going to grouch at me. Okay, and I already know this, I've already been grouched at it about this topic. These are the, the prices that we utilized for the inputs in this trial. We called our retailers and dealers and said, give us a price. No one wanted to give me a price. So if you don't like the price, I blame you guys for not telling me what I should use. Okay? So you can argue about these, what you want, that's fine. So just be known that going forward, these are the prices we use for our, our, our yield, or our probability of return on investment. Some of these we were able to tank mix with a glyphosate application, so there's not an app, uh, there's not a application cost in there. Some of these would not be, per se, with a glyphosate, so we would add a application charge with it because it really didn't make sense to tank mix it. Does that make sense? So we try to take all those factors into play as we did these. Here's one I really want to show people. This high yield system where I threw everything in the kitchen sink at, that was the cost of inputs on a per acre basis, $156. Okay, again, as an input, as a farmer, you may get a better price than I do. <coughs> Depending on how many acres you get, you guys know how the pricing game goes. But that was the, this is the baseline price for the high input system, $156 an acre. So, I'm not really spending a lot of time in the south because I don't really care about that. Central, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on here in the central port. I think most of you would probably be more of a response to the northern part. But in general, the biggest probability of return on investment would have been this foliar insecticide driving the ship. Now remember, we were getting significant yield responses, but remember that yield response has to pay for what? That input. All right, so make sure you, that's, I want to be clear. So here's the north. So we have some interesting things going on in the north. We see a lot more probability return on investment. Let's look right here at, you know, we, um, Illinois, forgive me if I'm wrong, I think you guys had the highest 
Now, Iowa may, may have beat you. I think your 56 bushels per acre was a state average yield, okay, if I remember correctly. So depending on, so we'll use $9 beans and a 60 bushel yield level. If you guys are at 75 bushels with the irrigation, follow these lines. So that's how that's set up. So here is the treatment. Here is the price, grain sale price for bean. And here are the different yield levels that we're at, just so you can kind of follow along. So let's say 60 bushel beans, $9 beans. Right here, the fungicide and insecticide, the seed treatment package was 50-50. However, you get into a 75 bushel yield environment, what's the probability of return on investment? 71%. What does that mean? That means 71% of the time you are at least going to break even, if not make money on it. That's what that number means. All right? Let's get down here to some of these other ones. What are other pops? Foliar insecticide popped. The foliar insecticide plus foliar fungicide popped. Okay, I want to be clear here. I've been very cautious of not putting this on my blog yet. There's a couple reasons for this. You all already have frog eye resistant, uh, frog eye, fungicide resistant frog eye leaf spot in this state. So I'm, I really want to be cautious with growers that if you are going to be going out and putting prophylactic applications of fungicides and insecticides, you're at least putting out multiple modes of action to manage that. Okay, can you all be clear with that? Because money is one thing, but we don't want to be losing this technology. Same thing with the insecticides, but you, I've already got my butt chewed. Make sure you delete butt out of that, thank you. Um, I've already got my rear end chewed by entomologists about this. Okay, and I understand, IPM, scouting, uh, only less than 20% of the time we are above any type of academic threshold with this POPs. I just want to be clear on that. Make sure we follow IPM strategies, but I also have to report what the data are. Yes, sir. So, so did you do any scouting to see yep. what your pressures were there? We did. We scouted, and rarely were we above threshold, less than 20% of the time we were above threshold for any one insect pest. And on uh, diseases, we were never above threshold on any disease pest. So some of these responses are, are, ge are geographic versus site? This would, have, this would have been across the entire northern. So this is all of our northern sites lumped together. So this would have been you know, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Michigan environments where we saw these responses pop from. Okay, sir? So Sean, are you saying then it's a multi-pest complex interaction that, where they're all <laughs> below threshold and not one of them would indicate a need to spray, but when you spray, you're getting a significant response. So that is, there's two things going on. One, I would suggest that there's possibly this multi-pest complex. So when entomologists yell at me, and they do, yes. um, I, my pushback is, well, there's either two things going on. There's either a physiological response, which we know can happen from some of these insecticides. We've, we've measured it with thymethoxane. We've also measured it with, um, with basically Warrior or Fury or any of the other um, yeah. The, comp, the class just, I forgot the class off the top of my head, but we've, we've noticed it with both <coughs> types of chemistry. So it could be physiological and it could be. So I, why I sell this to entomologists, say this is a research opportunity for you to go out and see, can we classify these multi-pest complexes out there? Now, you guys are really fortunate in Illinois that you don't have an entomologist anymore. <laughs> Lucky you. We don't have an entomologist in Wisconsin anymore. So. I've been, I, I am not an entomologist, I don't even play one on TV, but uh, again, the data are what they are, I'm not going to hide it, I'm going to talk about it, talk about the realities that we're seeing out there and make sure we manage this properly. And I think where I push this with my growers is we get into late August and that aphid threshold is sitting at 200 aphids for three weeks in a row and they got a late bean out there and it's hovering. And growers always ask me, what should I do, what should I do, what, I sh what should I do? And as an agronomist, I say, well, I look at this number right here, and it said, you know, if you want a waiver on it, this tells me you're going to get your money back, we're going to control some, some pests. You know, it's kind of right, right at that marginal threshold level. So that's how I couch it. But again, to be clear, I'm a still a big proponent of IPM. We need to be scouting and looking at these things, but the data is what it is. So bring on your hate mail. Okay. Next. Um, what am I going to talk about? All right. I got to keep bugging here. Does anyone have any other questions? I'll leave it. The nitrogen and fertility was interesting as you. Yeah. So the, the high yield environment. Yep. Positive response. So 
the, the yield response is positive. However, based on the price of nitrogen, it's, it's basically break even at best. Uh, this year was the first, well, besides this experiment, we're, we're seeing this. And it's kind of like Pioneer put this thing out two years ago through their, their growth program. They were getting basically three to four bushels but, but of, of increased yield adding nitrogen. Well, if you did the math, that was break even. So for you all, given what's going on in the state of Illinois with water protection, is that a good idea for sustainability to throw nitrogen out there for a break-even process? The answer to that is no. Some people may disagree with me. I also think there's some false information being put out there about the nitrogen needs of soybeans. Okay? And um, the reason is a lot of these nitrogen demands was based on this paper uh, Selvagati et al. If you haven't even seen this paper, he did basically a meta-analysis looking at nitrogen. And what they did is they overestimated the amount of nitrogen soybeans actually need on a per bushel basis. It's actually 100 pounds less than what that Salvagotti et al. paper said at 100 bushel beans. And I had a grad student that did this work, and it's, I have, I've got to review it, and this will be going out shortly. And it's pretty cool stuff. What it shows is in high yield environments, soybeans are really efficient at taking stripping that plant of nitrogen. Basically taking every ounce of nitrogen out of that plant it possibly can. And instead of taking, you know, a lower yield environment, it may be only using 80% of the total plant nitrogen. In high yield environment, it's using over 90%. And one of the other cool things we've seen over time is soybeans keep taking up nitrogen all the way to that plant is dead. If you looked at the old papers, it, um, that would have been fair and it wasn't fair and cavernous. Hanaway and Weber. Okay, Hanaway and Weber. If you ever see how that soybean plant grows and develops at Iowa State publication, we've all seen that. If you've seen those charts in there, it shows P and K and N stops uptake at R6.5. In today's genetics, it's no longer true. We're taking it up, I'm trying to remember, P all the way through, N all the way through. K does stop at 6.5 still but P and N differ. Uh, so it's, it's cool, my grad student did this, and we basically have over, what is it, 8,000 tissue samples that we've done on yield environments from 30 bushel beans all the way to 109 bushel beans in every environment or every yield level between that. So we've got this thing nailed down. So that paper will be coming out. I gotta review it today. Push that thing out the door, but it's a pretty cool stuff. Not just because I did it, but. Uh, <laughs> You're gonna have a little bit of humor. So am I done? What time am I supposed to be done at? Oh, I got 15 minutes, good. Because I got like two hours left to talk about. All right, let's talk about, I'll keep this quick and dirty for some time. Let's talk about cultivar by input interaction. So I'm gonna whip through this really quick. The, we, had, we basically went to seed companies, to their breeders and said give us your highest yielding varieties. Okay, that's what I want. I don't want, you know, this whole racehorse, workhorse stuff. I can debate that for an hour, but I just want the stuff that yields. Okay, that's what I really want. With that, so we had different company profiles that we were looking at here to get, to get across, uh, you know, to make sure there wasn't any company, I don't want to really say bias, but if you know the breeding, breeding systems, so this would be, if you took all the Pioneer's germplasm, they're here. Monsanto's is all here. Uh, Stein's is all here. So they're very separate. They're very disjointed. You don't see a lot of this in soybean genetics. Okay? And in fact, one of the interesting things, and again, I, I'm 90% I'm sure this is correct, so if I'm wrong, feel free to tell me I'm wrong. But the genetic diversity in all soybean varieties commercially right now is less than one inbred hybrid in corn. It just lets you know the genetic diversity is in the soybean side. Okay, so that kind of gives you a framework of what we're looking at here. We have our input systems would be our standard. Again, what we recommend to growers are best manager practices. We had our soya complete, which is everything. And then the soya minus foliar fungicide. Same interactions. So here's some cool stuff that popped out of this. Okay, only three of 53, or basically 6% had a cultivar by input interaction, okay? So 94% of the top percent of the time, we did not have a cultivar by input interaction. So what does that mean? 
What does that mean to you as a grower, as a crop consultant? If there's not an input by cultivar interaction, what does that mean? That's beautiful. That's the best thing that can ever happen. Because if you have an input figured out in your farm, 94% of the time, it doesn't matter what genetics you throw at it, you're going to get the same response. So that way we can stop messing around with all this. How did this variety do with this input? Obviously, if it's weak on frog eye, it's weak on frog eye. You know, you're going to have these holes you got to fill. But be, generally speaking, that's good stuff. So we actually had less interactions than we did have variety differences in input, interest, uh, input interactions, which is pretty cool. Uh, let's just talk about the northern part. Again, this just gives you an idea, our standard practice. So yeah, we were getting about five bushels thrown in the kitchen sink at it. And we can measure that. It's pretty easy. And where that was coming from, let's go to the north, primarily. Oops. That's not what I want to talk about. This is central. Let's go northern. What we're tending to see is more seeds per meter squared, okay, which means you're having basically more pods out there or more plants. That's how you get more seeds per unit area. It's also increased seed size. So we're seeing the early season inputs prior to the R3s give us more pods, more seeds per unit area. And then the late season inputs are giving us what? Bigger seed. That's how we're getting these yield. We're seeing both of those occur in these, with these inputs. Again, these are some of the yield levels. I'm not going to talk too much yield components. This is kind of boring. I already talked about this stuff. So that was a pretty, those are the stories I like to tell. It's clean, it's concise, tells us where our yield inputs are coming from. So there's another one I want to quickly talk through is population by input interactions. And what we really want to look at here is what are we seeing? Are we seeing us protecting yield over the different populations? Are we seeing us improving yield? Because there's two different th philosophies there. So let's sort this out. We looked at seeding rates. So these are what we dropped, anywhere from 50,000 seeds per acre all the way to 200,000 seeds per acre. And again, standard practice, soya complete. Just trying to sort this out. I'm not going to bore you with a lot of Anyone want to do some calculus? Anyone interested? You know, talking about derivatives and area under the curve. Fun stuff. Let's not talk about low yield environments because they're boring. Let's not talk about average. Let's talk about our high yield environments. A couple things really popped out. They're pretty cool. So in these high yield environments where we're pushing over 80 bushels per acre, okay, we'll have some here that are up over 100. That's what these points are. So 80, probably 85 bushels per acre is our average in these high yield environments. Two inter interesting things popped up. We got 99% of maximum yield at that population, 42,000, okay? It's, it's crazy. I know, it's crazy talk right there. But remember, soybeans are physiologically different than corn. In a good yield environment, okay, let me flip that around. In a poor yield environment, what do you do, and if you have sandy, clay knolls, what do you do with your corn population in a poor yield environment? You drop it. What do you do with soybeans? Jack it up. Totally opposite. So anyone that has prescription planters now, you always bought them. Remember that when you go through, jack it up in the bad yield, poor yielding environments, drop it down in the low yielding environments. Yeah, no, high yielding. Sorry, I even get confused myself. So that's pretty interesting right there. Because you know, I know you guys are always told, you got to get high yields, you got to push that population out there. Well, then you run into lodging, you run into those challenges that you have to deal with trying to pick those beans up. Here's another cool thing. Oh, I, I, I'll show it here. This, here's a cool thing. Now, see this line right here? This is my soya yield, which is my kitchen sink treatment or input, inputs in general. Here's my untreated check which is base recommendations. We see, you see this difference here, okay, between those two? That's the response difference. So this would be for a, a response, a responsive treatment. So anywhere from 200,000 all the way down to 40,000, we have that same level of response. And why is that important to you as a farmer? The way I look at it is, I grew up on a dairy farm just north of Freeport, Monroe, Wisconsin. If anyone's familiar with Monroe, Limburger cheese, that's what my family, our milk goes to make Limburger cheese. My grandfather would walk out these stands and say, man, that's a crappy stand. I'm not throwing any more money 
at that stand because it's garbage. This data tells us that if you have an input responsive, an input that's responsive, how low is it responsive to? All the way down to sub 50,000. So still put it on, even if you only got 60,000 beans out there, 60,000 plants per, per acre. Put it on, because it's still going to be what? Responsive. You're still going to measure that response. Again, if, just make sure it's economical and it's something that's responsive on your farm. Um, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to talk about that. All right, so I got eight minutes. Do you want me to bang through some Ilevo stuff, or do you want to just open it up for questions? What do you want to do? I, I'm whatever you guys want me to do. Ilevo, I'll do a quick and dirty one. First, first of all, I'd like to thank the United Soybean Board and all of our university partners for this research, because without that funding, without this work, it couldn't have been done. If anyone needs to get a hold of me, here's my webpage, coolbean.info. My Badger handle, I'm, my Badger handle, my Twitter handle, I'm at Badgerbean, and this is my, my blog that I blog out of. All right, so this last year, we ran about 1,440 plots across the state of Wisconsin looking at the response of Pancho Votivo and Pancho Votivo plus Ilevo. We looked at from populations all the way from, from I only dropped 40,000 seeds per acre up to dropping 140,000 seeds per acre. These are all the sites we did it across the state. Just give you a sense of environments, yield environments, <coughs> pressures, and whatnot. Here's our yield variability. I always ask a stats question to the audience. So is this variability good or bad for making interpretations? Is it yes or no, good or bad? Someone say good. <laughs> good, excellent, and why is it good? Because if you have an input that's responsive over all this variability, what does that tell you? It's pretty consistent, right? That's what you guys want, it's consistency. This isn't Vegas, okay? You want to be able to win all the time, not just get lucky. Um, you all, anybody that walked, I leave a plot, saw this. And again, we tended, we saw the same thing. I didn't care what genetics it was, what planting date it was on. Anyway, from May 1 to June 15th, we saw this. They call it the, the halo effect. I think that's a really good marketing term. Um, that's what we saw, that crop injury. That, but what does that mean to us? As a farmer, nothing. We saw no stand loss. We saw they grew out of it. It's not a big deal. Anyone that grew beans before 1996 knows that this is not crop injury at all. That's just common growing beans. And I don't see too many glyphosate. Oh, there's, there's a glyphosate baby right there. A couple of them here. <laughs> <laughs> Ones that didn't know, didn't walk beans. Maybe now, but not then. All right, let's talk about seed treatments. This is stand. I'm not going to bore you with stand. Here's yield. So. What we tend to see is a 3% yield increase with the insecticide, okay? Whereas this comes back into, the, into play is this, is this pushback from that they want to remove uh, neonicotinoids. Um, our data is pretty clear and consistent. We see responses almost every year to neonicotinoids, and we publish a lot of papers. Our papers are cited a lot of times in those EPA reports, so we tend to see it. If we do not have SDS or SCN, we don't see any advantage of Olivo. Okay, it's a product that you, you need to place it. Where we do have, oh, uh, let's go here. Where we do have SDS, that's what we saw. So if you're a farmer, crop consultant, if you have a field that is, has, has a history of SDS, it's not rock, it's not bulletproof, but our data lines up with stuff that Carl Bradley did before he bailed ship to go to Kentucky, what Iowa State shows, Michigan State shows. Uh, what's going on in Illinois? Why is everyone leaving? Even Forte left. Oh, he got kicked out, but anyhow. But in short, this is a product that does have efficacy on SDS, and if you have those fields with a known history, just, it, it does work, but it's not bulletproof. If you have a field that's a train wreck with SDS, you're still going to have what at the end? You're still going to have SDS. I think it has an upper limit to how much efficacy, but even in these moderate to heavy fields, the probability of return on investment is pretty good if, you, if it's a known history of SDS. So I think it's pretty clear. I think the jury's still out on efficacy on SCN. I know a bunch of people are looking at it. I think the jury's still out on that, but for SDS, for sure, it's, 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 a, it's a good product. 
All right, ding. That means I'm done, right? I heard that. All right, what time is it? Three minutes. Any questions or three minutes? Yes, sir. One standout input you, you recommend to get an ISR ROI. What stand? What stand, what one input for best ROI for it. Here, here are my top, can I give you four? Yeah. Can I give you four? <laughs> Number one, invest in genetics. Do not skimp on, just because of, if a variety has proven genetics, our data shows a 17 to 35% yield difference between the highest and lowing, lowest variety across our sites. That's, you know, that average 25%. Very few other soybean inputs give you a 25% variability. Citrate would give you three to five, okay? Genetics, number one. Number two, do not skimp on potassium. Potassium is the fertilizer input, okay? You know, driving the whole ship. We see, I hear a lot of stuff about phosphorus in our soils in Wisconsin. We can have soil test P levels under eight parts per million, which is nothing. I mean, that's, there's big no P out there, and we do not see a response to P fertilizer until we get our K levels up high enough, okay? So potassium is driving that ship. Number two, pre or three, a pre emergence herbicide. Regardless if you got water hemp, glyphosate resistant water hemp, you know, that is a big driver right there because modes of action, the data is pretty clear. You know, even when if you can still get away with one pass glyphosate application, if you time it wrong and you have a wide row spacing, you're talking 15 to 20 percent yield penalty. With a, a V4 application on 30 inch row beans, you're getting 15 percent yield loss. Okay? You can, if, even at 15 to, at 15 percent yield loss on 60 bushel beans, it's 9 bushels times 8, that's 72 dollars. What's a pre going to cost you? It's not going to cost you $72. Um, and the last point I want to make is I know it's not sexy, I know it's boring, but you're not going to get responses to these other inputs until you get the basic agronomy 101 done first. And then start looking at the other stuff. Because I see a lot of times guys will skip on K and they'll invest in something else and they don't get a, a good response. Why is it? Because your K test level is holding you back or your weed control program is holding you back. I get a question about inoculants. I'll just mention that. Inoculants, um, you know, two bushels is what we tend to see. Even in a corn soybean rotation, two bushels with a good inoculant. Now, not all inoculants are the same. If you, you know, just be aware of that. They're not all the same. But with a good, good inoculant, even in a corn soybean rotation with 30 years, two bushels is what we see significant increases. Even high yield. Yeah.